Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. This time I'm back talking again about Fordham University, its history, its hauntings, and its urban legends. This episode is going to be much more toward the urban legend side, I would say. The last two episodes, in particular the most recent episode, dealt a little bit more with what I would say is more legitimate paranormal experiences, like accounts with quotes from people who went on the record and put their name next to their own paranormal story. And, you know, I also talked about a potentially paranormal experience that I had at Queen's Court, which was the dorm I talked about in the last episode. And this time I want to talk about another dorm that I lived in. And while there's plenty of unpleasantness associated with my memories of living in this dorm, Hughes Hall, I didn't have any straightforwardly paranormal experiences, and many of the stories I found about the dorm really have more the flavor of urban legends versus actual paranormal experiences that people witnessed. And of course, these urban legends are very much influenced by the fact that part of the 1973 movie, The Exorcist, was filmed at the storm. So I'll talk about that building, I'll talk about some of the filming of The Exorcist, some of the supposedly paranormal events that happened around the filming of The Exorcist on campus, and I'll also talk about the university cemetery. So in case anyone's jumping in on this episode and hasn't listened to the last two, I'm doing a series about what I believe is perhaps the most concentrated area of hauntings in all of New York City, Fordham University's Bronx campus which is, you know, only about half a mile wide and maybe a third of a mile tall. So it's a really small area, but there are so many stories of the paranormal associated with it. And for folks who aren't from the area, Fordham University is a private Jesuit school, so a Catholic school. It's a university, and then there's also a prep school for boys attached to it. And it is where I went to college. One thing that I realized I should maybe mention, because I know there might be some people listening who are like, hey, I live in or near New York City. I want to check out Fordham University and maybe see what it's like, walk around campus, investigate, etc. It's worth me mentioning that Fordham is a closed campus. So it was almost like a joke when I was a student there, because every time you went on and off campus, you had to show your ID to a guard. And the the campus is surrounded by a fence. And if memory serves, part of that fence has literal like barbed wire at the top, though not the part that is pretty and, you know, kind of gets pictures taken of it that often. It is very much a closed campus. I actually want to visit it sometime soon because I have plans to go to the New York Botanical Gardens in the next couple of weeks, which is right next to campus. And so I want to drop by Fordham beforehand. And honestly, I'm like, I wonder if they'll even accept my alumni ID card. I haven't been to campus since 2015. And they were fine with my ID card then. But I've had folks, security guards at the Lincoln Center campus, which is the Manhattan campus, not accept my alumni ID card. So we'll see if I have trouble getting on campus or not. But If for some reason you want to visit campus and you did not attend Fordham, I would strongly recommend calling ahead to see if they would even let you on. You might be able to call ahead and get your name put on like a list and just show your ID to like your state ID or whatever to the guard on duty. I don't totally know how that works. Whenever I had people visit me, they would just meet, I would just meet them at the gate, but they are very much a closed campus. They're not a very welcoming place. And I'm sure that has nothing to do with the feelings of anxiety and paranormal experiences, etc. that people experience on campus, right? So anyway, I wanted to make sure to mention that just to save anyone a fruitless trip to the Bronx if you wanted to visit and thought that, you know, maybe like a normal university, you could just walk on campus. No, Fordham likes to be exclusionary. So let's get to today's topic and talk about Hughes Hall, which used to be a dorm and is now the university's business school headquarters. 
So the building was built in 1891. It's one of, you know, kind of the older buildings on campus. And before I get into the haunted stories about the hall and, you know, the urban legends that abound about the building, I want to talk a little bit about what it was like to live there and what the living conditions were like. Since when it comes to haunted places, I really do think that living conditions have such a huge impact on what kind of stories are told there, right? If you are living in an unpleasant place, you're going to have unpleasant stories about it and your brain will like autofill, oh, this place feels bad. I know the exorcist was filmed here. Bad stuff must be going on here, right? So I'm, I can only really speak about my own experience, but I absolutely believe that the unpleasant nature of what it was like to live in this building definitely contributed to people kind of like looking for urban legends that could take place in this building, if that makes sense. Not saying that all stories of hauntings are untrue about this building. I'm not trying to say the building's not haunted, but I think the reason why I had more trouble finding real specific paranormal stories with people's names attached, etc., and in, instead they were just kind of like vague, like people say blah, blah, blah type urban legends. I think the reason for that is just because like, it's very difficult to live somewhere that unpleasant and not say to yourself, man, something bad must be afoot here. So anyway, I lived in Hughes Hall for two summers. It was considered the worst or second worst dorm on campus, I would say. And it was a freshman dorm during the school year. And during the summer, it was where people were offered housing. If you wanted to live on campus during the summer, you were a student and, you know, maybe you were taking classes or maybe you were working on campus, you know, that's where they would put you. There were much nicer dorms on campus, but they didn't put students there over the summer. They would put like summer camp type programs there and they would save the real crappy dorm for students. Pretty much the only amenity it had was they did have window air conditioning units in the building during the summer. So at least we had AC, which some buildings on campus did not even get window AC units when I lived there. So that's why I lived there. And I guess to be fair, it was very, very affordable to live there. I want to say I paid like five or six hundred dollars to live there for a whole summer each summer. But there was a reason why it was so cheap. So the building at the time that I lived there was made up of rooms that housed four students each. The typical room would have two sets of bunk beds. And I remember when I lived there, the bunk beds were very tall because while the rooms were small, the ceilings were pretty high, at least on the floors that I lived on. And there was no ladder to get up to the top bunk. So my second summer, I did live on the top bunk. And I remember every night, I had to climb up the side of the bed. Like there was kind of some rails on the side of the bed, not a ladder, but just rails. So I had to climb up the side of the bed, up those beams. And then every morning I would wake up before my roommate woke up and I climbed down and collected the stuff that had fallen from my bed into her bed every morning. Usually my phone and whatever book I was reading would have fallen down from my bunk to her bunk. Every night during the night, I don't know why, but it's real weird to, you know, climb down the side of this bed that's definitely supposed to have some sort of, you know, little ladder to get up it. And then like collect your belongings from the bed of someone who's still asleep on the bottom bunk. Very weird. Each student had a desk in the room and there were no closets because, you know, the building was not meant to be a dorm ever. So each student had a wardrobe. The rooms were so small that the beds would typically be pushed up toward the windows, and then the desks would be pushed together in an area kind of between the wardrobes and the door. I remember it was very cramped. Each floor had a communal bathroom down the hall, and there was a single kitchen for the entire dorm, which was down in the basement. But I think the first summer that I lived there, there was something wrong with it, so we didn't really have full use of it. So I remember my roommate had a contraband microwave in our room which we were definitely not supposed to have. And we really only ate things you could make in the microwave for a summer. I think the idea was that, you know, during the school year, the students living there would be on a meal plan. So 
didn't matter that there wasn't a kitchen, but during the summer, there wasn't really a meal plan. I think the first summer I worked out something where I could eat in the cafeteria maybe like three to five times a week. So I would get like a real meal, maybe three to three to five times a week that first summer. You know, the rest of the time I was eating oatmeal or whatever you can make in a microwave. And then the second summer, I remember myself walking down all these flights of stairs just to use the microwave or carrying my pan and spatula and ingredients up and down the stairs to use the stove. It was just awful. And when I lived there, they had stopped maintaining the building because they had already made plans to gut it and, you know, turn it into this shiny new business school building, which is what it is now. So the second summer, I remember that they started cutting holes in the walls of the stairwell and in the common areas. So everything was covered in a fine white powder, I assume from the paint and drywall debris. So they were literally, it felt like they were literally taking apart the building while I was living there. And the water pressure got really screwed up in the showers. So the water pressure was painfully strong to the point where it hurt my skin. So every time I took a shower, I had to bring a washcloth and a rubber band, and I had to secure the washcloth over the shower head using the rubber band in order to diffuse the water pressure enough so that I could shower. But also, the ceiling over the shower had been cut open or removed. There had been like ceiling tiles there, and some of them were missing at that point. So debris from the ceiling like, you know, the area between the ceiling of the bathroom and the floor of the floor above would fall onto you in the shower. So often I would get out of the shower and I have to clean this gross debris from the ceiling off my skin. It was really grimy, let's say. And the first summer we possibly had bed bugs in the room where we were assigned. One of my roommates ended up covered in these huge bug bites all around her stomach and her waist. They were, I've never seen bug bites like these. They were like welts almost. And the rest of us were getting bites, but they were were much smaller. Maybe she was allergic to whatever was biting her. The university sent exterminators, but that didn't seem to help. So then they moved us to a bigger, better room after that. Because, you know, the whole situation looked pretty bad. And... You know, I think they wanted to appease us a little bit by moving us to a better room, which I did appreciate. So there weren't many students who lived there during the summer, and the fourth and fifth floors were empty. So they just moved us into an empty room on the abandoned fourth floor, and uh, that's where we spent the summer. I remember at the time looking up The Exorcist, because I remembered that part of The Exorcist had been filmed there, and wouldn't you know it? The scene that was filmed in Hughes Hall was filmed on the fourth floor of Hughes Hall. At the time, I didn't know what room the filming happened in, though while doing the research for this episode, I saw that it was apparently filmed in room 417. I can't remember what room they moved us to on the fourth floor, but it was a huge corner room on the far west side of the building. I think it would have been the corner room, you know, at the southwest corner of the fourth floor. No idea if that's the room from The Exorcist or not, but there is something a little bit funny about being specifically moved to this abandoned floor where The Exorcist was filmed for the summer. They were like, yeah, let's get these complaining students out of the way. The room was big enough so that we didn't have to have bunk beds in that new room. So, you know, there was enough floor space to have all the beds standing on their own, which was wild. And I mean, remember, this is New York City. So when I say the room was like huge... I'd guess from memory and from comparing it to places I've lived since, it was maybe 300 square feet. So not not really a huge room. While we lived on this otherwise empty floor, I don't think we had any paranormal stuff happen, but it was weird. The vibe was very bad there. And usually I would just spend evenings reading outside on the quad. And then I would just go back to the dorm to sleep after, you know, well after dark. Once I woke up during the night, hearing screams, but it was just my roommates trying to chase a rat out of our room and down the hall. Most mornings I woke up and I saw that I had spider bites on me, like a lot of spider bites, but that might have just been from being out on the quad the evening before. Though my roommates often had bug bites, just not not as, none of us had bad ones like the ones my roommate had before we moved rooms. So I guess it was different bugs that were biting us. And since there were four of us and we were always, you know, someone was always going in and out to use the restroom down the hall or whatever, as long as someone was home, we usually just kept the door unlocked, even when we were asleep. 
So once we were all asleep, it was the middle of the night and someone came into our room, but I think it was just a drunk person who had walked up an extra flight of stairs accidentally and thought they were on the third floor and tried to walk into our room. I remember my roommate got up and just shoved this person out and then locked the door. Definitely don't think it was paranormal, but you know, it was, it was kind of roughing it, I would say. The second summer in the building was less eventful. I think that that summer I lived on the third floor, but I can't remember for sure. But I do remember that second summer. I once went up to the fifth floor and I remember that at least some of the doors of the rooms were unlocked or like propped open. And the rooms on the fifth floor were just full of weird old furniture. It's like it was just being used for storage or something. At the time, it didn't really make sense to me, but maybe because we were the literally the last people to live there, like they were closing it basically after after that summer, if I'm remembering it correctly, they had just started like using the room for storage or the the hall for storage. I remember that floor creeped me out a lot. Like I remember it being very dark, none of the lights were on. I think the ceilings were a little lower because it was, you know, sort of in, a, the, in the mansard roof part of the ceiling. and. It had that real attic slash garret vibe. You know, the exterior walls that had windows were sort of slanted, if I'm remembering right. I only went up to the fifth floor that one time after my friend was like, oh, it's really creepy up on the fifth floor. So I went up and looked alone and then I just never went back because I was like, I don't like the vibe up here at all. So it wasn't a pleasant place to live. And I know I lived there under extraordinary circumstances being in the final cohort of people living there. But even under regular times, it was unpleasant and crowded with too many people, and I don't really believe that the building was that well maintained, even when it wasn't about to be completely gutted. I can't say for sure, but just knowing knowing what I know about Fordham dorms, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. So that's kind of the context of like what might it have been like to live in this dorm and to be someone there being like, there's something wrong with this building. What can be wrong with it? Is it haunted, etc. So let's get a little bit more into the history of the building. So Hughes Hall was originally called the Second Division Building. It was also called the, I think, the Junior Division Building. It was basically a high school slash boarding school. It was where the prep school was. So I found an article in the RAM written in 1990, which had some information about what it was like, and then also in the book Fordham, A History and Memoir, which I mentioned in the past episodes that's written by Raymond Schroth, that there's a good description of what it was like in that book as well. So here's what I've pieced together. The building was completed and occupied by around September 1890. And here's what each floor was originally used for. So the first floor was a gym. It had an extra tall ceiling for that reason. It also contained a billiard room, reading room, and restrooms. I don't really know why, like, a high school would have a billiard room, but maybe billiards were just really popular back then. The second floor had the vice president's office, a study hall with a slanted floor that led to a stage, and some classrooms. The third floor had eight large classrooms, which could hold about 50 students each. The fourth floor was a dorm, and apparently it was one huge room with a sliding door that could divide it in half if you wanted to. I don't know why they would have the whole floor be a dorm. That seems like a really weird choice, like, and not, you know, not put up walls, but maybe it was just easier to, like, check on the kids that way or something. The fifth floor was a wardrobe, which that raises some question marks to me. I'm like, wait, why does a boarding school need, like, a whole wardrobe upstairs? But I wonder if that means, like, a storage area. That's probably the case. And then later, it was converted into individual rooms for boarding students, and they called it Madison Avenue. I don't know why. Maybe it was, like, nicer than the fourth floor rooms. And it might have been private rooms versus, like, the one big room. That could have been it as well. So according to Fordham's website, the second division building was renamed Hughes Hall after the school's founder, Archbishop John Hughes, who I've talked about enough already, but... You can listen to the past episodes of this Fordham series if you want to hear more about that guy, or you can listen to, I did two episodes about Calvary Cemetery last year, and the second of those episodes, I talk a lot about him, 
in the history of the Catholic Church in New York. So if you want to know more about him, check that out. But his nickname was Dagger John, which tells you about what you need to know about him. So the new prep school building, the one that's still being used today, was opened in 1972. So in June 1973, all the prep school stuff had been moved out of Hughes Hall, and Hughes was turned into a, quote, multidisciplinary building, housing facility offices, athletic facilities, and conference rooms. Then by 78, the building was mostly just used for storage. In 1982, quote, the first three floors are converted into a temporary dormitory for 180 freshmen. Then in summer of 1984, they converted the fourth and fifth floor into dorm rooms and they added a elevator. The timeline of the building's history and renovation doesn't mention any additional changes or improvements to the building until 2012 when it opened as the new business school. So we can assume that the building that I lived in those two summers was basically unchanged from what it would have been like in the 80s. So The Exorcist the movie came out in 1973, like I mentioned. Principal photography started in August of 72, and it went on for 200 days. I'm not sure when the parts that were filmed at Fordham happened, but it sounds like it probably would have been filmed there between the building being vacated and then being turned into the multi multidisciplinary building. So much like the summers I spent there, the building probably would have been mostly empty at that time. And also, apparently, since the building didn't have an elevator yet, they had to remove the windows so they could bring up the camera on a crane. I don't totally understand that, but maybe the camera was just too big and heavy to bring up the stairs. So that's why they handled it that way. So as far as I'm concerned, before we even get to the urban legends about this building, this place is cursed and awful, you know? It's... The vibe there is very bad. It's an unpleasant place to live. It was never supposed to be a dorm in the first place. They kind of just like stuck people there because they didn't have somewhere better to put them. And, you know, it's a building that just wasn't being used for what it was being, what it was intended to be used for. Like nowadays, it's the business school that is very much a return to kind of like what that building was intended for. I did find a kind of nice reminiscence of Hughes Hall written by someone who went to Fordham Prep which I wanted to read because it kind of like, you know, I can only talk about what it was like as a dorm, but I liked that this guy wrote kind of what it was like to be a high school student there. So the man who wrote this was named Joe Brennan. It sounds like he may have attended during the 1960s. This blog post was written in 2009 on his blog, warofyesterday.blogspot.com. But I thought it was a nice description, you know, of just what it used to be like there. So I'm going to read from that. Huge Hall was our name for the building Fordham Prep was in. Hughes Hall. It wasn't that big. That's why we called it Huge. We noticed that the steam radiators had a date from the 1880s cast into them. And being the youngsters we were, with our minds on the present, that seemed too impossibly old to be true. But it was. It was less than 100 years old at the time. Some of the classrooms still had the old iron desks attached to the floor the wooden desktop equipped with a pencil groove and a hole for the ink bottle, the wood worn beautifully smooth by generations of boys. The walls had real slate blackboards. It was a great atmosphere. It reeked of tradition. Hughes was too old to be a steel building. The support system was the external stone walls and a single row of iron columns down the center on the long axis, visible only on the ground floor where the space was opened up for a gym. Yes, a gym with padded iron columns within it. Oof. The stone wall on the ground floor was three feet thick, making for nice window seats. So that's what the building was like in its prep school days. So if, as some have suggested, there are potentially ghosts of former prep school students who wander the halls, that might be the building that they are remembering and thinking about as they explored the building as it was you know, once it was made into a dorm. And that's what they might be comparing it to. Or that's, I mean, who knows? Maybe they were seeing it just as it was when they were there. I don't know how that works with ghosts. So I found a little bit more information about why they decided to turn this building into a dorm and what the construction for that was like. So 
in the book Fordham, A History of the Jesuit University of New York, 1841 to 2003, by Thomas J. Shelley, which was published in 2016. There's a description of how Hughes Hall became a dorm. Finley, the university president at the time, sent a panic-stricken letter to the Jesuit community at the beginning of the summer, warning them that the university could not provide housing for more than 200 incoming freshmen. As an emergency measure, Finley converted three floors of Hughes Hall, the former site of Fordham Prep, into student housing. But he admitted that it was only a stopgap solution. So while the university would build more housing, it seems like housing always was an issue because that stopgap solution was still in place in the early 2010s when I was a student there. So in terms of how they converted the building, it seems that they just cut the classrooms in half or possibly thirds and turned them into dorm rooms, you know, which, like I said, slept four people each in two bunk beds that were maybe three feet apart from each other. And I guess they must have added showers to the existing restrooms, but, you know, you could tell just being in there that it was just a stopgap thing and it shouldn't really have continued. I mean, I've heard about a lot of colleges with housing shortages, but I don't know that I've heard of another one that had a dorm that just as a matter of course was like, no, we have quad rooms and it's not a suite with two rooms with, with, you know, two people each. It is a single room with four people shoved in there in bunk beds. Like that, I just don't think that's a normal thing. So it makes sense that that dorm got eliminated and turned into something that made more sense. It's also maybe worth mentioning that Hughes was known as like the party dorm, which is no surprise because just entering your own tiny dorm room was basically like walking into a party. You know, if you don't want people to party a lot, maybe don't have them live in such close quarters on a college campus. I don't know. So that's enough background. Let's get into some ghost stories. So in the October 14th, 1982 issue of The Ram, there is an article that mentions that, quote, the top floor of Hughes Hall is reputed to be haunted by an unknown eerie specter. So I've also read that this ghost on the top floor is a young boy's ghost which makes sense since it was the prep school. It wouldn't surprise me if maybe more than one young boy haunted the halls because it was a prep school for a while. There was an article in the RAM that was printed in 1983 and was reprinted a few times that had a very, I think, silly anecdote about Hughes Hall, but it's also very telling. So to read from that, before its renovation as a new dorm, Hughes Hall sparked several rumors of being haunted. Reportedly, Bizarre Satan worship ceremonies occurred on the fourth floor, and strange cultish wall paintings, which depict burning flames against a heavenly sky, still survive to this day. So when I read that, I had to like stop and reread it because I was like, there is a lot going on in that description. So at first blush, I see this and I'm like, okay, this is a typical 80s satanic panic thing. The scariest thing in 1983, and also 85 and 88, which I think are the two times this article was reprinted in the RAM, the scariest thing at that time was the idea of, like, Satan worshippers, especially on a campus of a Catholic school where, you know, most people are Catholic, and, you know, it's a fairly religious student body, I would say, especially back then, I'm sure, but even in my day. It was very Catholic. It wasn't just Catholic in name. So there are a lot of religious people who are perhaps easily disturbed by ideas of Satan worshippers, even though I find it somewhat delightful and kind of funny. But here's what kind of confuses me about this story, right? So as we've learned, there was a little while where the building was basically empty, you know, just used for storage. So the prep school left the building in 72, and in 73 it was used as the multidisciplinary building, but by 78 it was basically just storage. So that means that in between 78 and 82, the building was basically empty. So I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that some prankster-type students, probably after drinking heavily, decide to break into Hughes Hall, you know, it's basically empty anyway, and they find a remote room, and they paint 
some kind of satanic thing on the wall. I mean, it just says cultish wall paintings with burning flames against a heavenly sky. Burning flames to me aren't necessarily satanic. And what is a heavenly sky anyway? That's just a sky. Like, I don't think these people were like great artists and they painted like, I don't know, Michelangelo, like angels. You know, I'm sure it was just like something that someone painted with spray paint. So this article is definitely sprucing up the story, kind of like adding some flourishes, which like, fine, that's what you should do, I guess, if you're a good writer. I don't know. It keeps the article interesting, I guess. But I think we today, as, you know, critical thinkers, can read this article and be like, okay, so there was some graffiti on the walls, someone painted some flames on the sky. Doesn't really sound satanic to me. It also doesn't really sound cultish to me. I don't, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. So now let's look at these bizarre Satan worship ceremonies on the fourth floor. So again, I think it's extremely plausible and likely that students decided to break into the building while it was not really being used for anything, go up to the fourth floor where maybe people won't hear their carousing as much, and have some drinks, hang out, use a Ouija board. You know, maybe they do some edgy stuff. At the time, the exorcist had just been filmed there, right? You know, if we're talking about sometime between 78 and 82, that's a decade or less after The Exorcist had had a scene filmed there. The Exorcist is a movie about a young girl who gets possessed after using a Ouija board. Okay, I don't think that there was a Satan worship ceremony, or if there was, it was probably just like a silly college kid thing where it's like, hey, we're drunk. Let's say hail Satan or something. I don't know. It's one of those things where it's like, I'm sure people partied there. Maybe they did some Ouija board stuff. Maybe they said some things that like seemed really edgy in an environment that is so Catholic and where like you and everyone you know were raised in religious households, etc. To me, it just sounds like edgy. It's edgy college kids stuff, right? People are like drunk and showing off and trying to have some fun, whatever. And that's if there's even any truth to the story and people, I mean, the really boring version of the story is no one was partying there and everyone just made made up stories about people partying there. Though I really hope that isn't the case. I hope that some people did take advantage of this empty building to have some some nice parties. And it also makes sense that we're talking about the fourth floor here, right, for these Satan worship ceremonies, because the fourth floor is where that scene in The Exorcist was filmed. Now, if you want to try to say like, oh, even this, if this wasn't like true Satan worship, which I find like very unlikely, like I said, this was the 80s and in the US at least, Satanic Panic was in full swing, right? Michelle Remembers, which is a book that kind of kicked off a lot of it, was published in 1980. This article was written in 83. So just a couple of years after. So maybe there's no Satan worship, but maybe you could say they were being edgy and like trying to summon something. You know, horror movies were really popular like they are now. Like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if they were playing around with a Ouija board. Maybe you could make the argument that like they were really trying to summon something or you know, in their showing off of like how edgy they could be, maybe they they ushered in some kind of paranormal activity. To me, there's not enough other evidence or like reports of things happening in that dorm to say even that like, yeah, maybe they summoned something by messing around with things they didn't understand. I don't know. I'm obviously not of the opinion that Ouija boards are like evil and super dangerous anyway. But I do think that any kind of tool used with the wrong intentions can maybe do bad things. But like, if that was the case, why aren't there more stories? You could argue maybe that in a building with so many people living in each room, you wouldn't notice if like something you had went missing or if you heard weird sounds, etc. Just because like, there's so much chaos. You're like, ah, my roommate probably moved it. Or like, oh, I hear a weird sound. That's probably my neighbor. So I do think that there are elements of Hughes Hall that would mask paranormal activity. 
And like, even if you look at the stories I have from Hughes Hall, which I don't think are paranormal, I do wonder if similar things had happened to me in another building that was just less crappy, if I would have been like, oh no, maybe something is afoot. It doesn't seem right that this weird stuff, you know, that I like wake up covered in spider bites every day and my stuff ends up in someone else's bed and someone came into my room, etc. But like, it's Hughes Hall. So definitely there was the attitude on campus where it's like, uh, it's, it's just Hughes, you know? So I do think that could have masked other paranormal experiences that people might've had. Though, again, I don't really actually think that the experiences I had there, there in Hughes were paranormal. So the last thing I want to mention, I know I read two sentences and I've been talking for probably like five minutes about my interpretation of these two sentences, but there's just one more thing I want to mention about these two sentences, which is how it says that the cultish wall paintings of fire and a sky are still to this day, this day being 1983, on the walls of Hughes Hall. That to me I find really credible because people were living in Hughes in 1983 and you could have just gone upstairs to the fourth floor and looked around and been like, yeah, okay, there's the painting or like, nope, I don't see the painting unless, you know, the doors were locked and you couldn't go in to confirm. But like, I don't think this writer would make this claim if those paintings weren't still there. So my guess is that they were in a hurry to convert it to a dorm. You know, they just converted the top or the bottom few floors. And they're like, eh, we're not doing anything with the fourth floor anyway. Let's not repaint the walls. We're too busy making this dorm thing work. So anyway, all of this to say out of this whole story, I do actually find the paintings, the idea that they're still there, very credible. I just don't know that they mean anything at all, aside from the fact that someone was drunk and had some spray paint or whatever. So to continue reading from the article... While The Exorcist was being filmed at Fordham, specifically in Hughes Hall, it's said that a large black dog came to set every day without fail. The animal didn't bother anyone, but the crew could not chase it away, no matter how hard they tried. It never returned after the film sequence was completed. I was so excited to read this. This was so interesting to me. Because black dogs are something that comes up in lots of accounts of paranormal encounters. I just wanted to read from the Wikipedia article about black dogs and folklore. I'm sorry to be someone reading from Wikipedia. I just thought it had a really good summary. The black dog is a supernatural, spectral, or demonic entity from English folklore. It is usually unnaturally large with glowing red or yellow eyes, is often connected to the devil, as an English incarnation of the hellhound, and is sometimes an omen of death. It's sometimes associated with electrical storms and also with crossroads, barrows as a type of fairy hound, places of execution, and ancient pathways. Black dogs are generally regarded as sinister or malevolent, and a few are said to be directly harmful. Some black dogs, however, are said to behave benevolently as guardian black dogs, guiding travelers at night onto the right path or protecting them from danger. So because I feel guilty quoting from Wikipedia, I also went over to my bookshelf and cracked open some real paper books that mentioned black dogs. And I wanted to talk about a little bit more of the folklore that I was reading there. So in the book, Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomenon, Volume 1, Folklore by Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner, which is one of my favorite books about the paranormal. There's a bit about familiar spirits that worked with witches and cunning men who are like witches. And to quote from the book, large black dogs are closely associated with witches and fairies, both as a guise for Satan and as familiars. The book goes on to talk about how black dogs have been sighted near Bigfoot and are just generally seen around areas of high strangeness. So I thought that was worth mentioning. And then also in the Encyclopedia of Demons and Demonology by Rosemary Ellen Geely, there's a bit about black dogs. And the encyclopedia says that they're often considered demons or the devil in shapeshifted form. Apparently in European witch hunts, people would claim that the witches would be, quote, visited by their master, the devil, in the shape of a black dog. So again, kind of this idea of like a familiar, but in this case, like a familiar or like 
a boss. Also, this next fact isn't relevant at all, but I found it interesting, so I wanted to share it. Apparently in Arabian lore, jinn like to take the form of a black dog in order to stay close to a person who they are attached to. So basically the idea is that magical creatures in general, whether they're good or bad, but often in English folklore are bad, they like to masquerade as black dogs. So it sounds like black dog lore in the U.S. is most prevalent in New England, which makes sense since it came over with the English colonizers, you know, this idea, the English idea of this black dog phenomena. In particular, Meriden, Connecticut has had black dog legends associated with an area called the Hanging Hills since the 19th century. So black dog lore is alive and well in the tri-state area, for sure. And at least while I was at Fordham, a ton of people who attended the university are from Connecticut because it's so close. So it makes sense that the black dog lore and legend, this urban legend, may have made its way to Fordham and into some of the lore of the university. Now the question is, is it just an urban legend that came about because people in Connecticut were familiar with the myth? Or did the people from Connecticut just notice the black dog and find it worthy of note because they were familiar with the legend? I don't know, but I don't see this black dog story mentioned really anywhere but this article that was reprinted a couple times. It is interesting to me that the Fordham legend of the black dog doesn't mention glowing red or yellow eyes or the dog emitting creepy howls, which are parts of the black dog lore. I tried to figure out if a black dog was sighted elsewhere during the exorcist production, like other places that they went, did the black dog follow? I couldn't find anything. I wonder if the black dog was some sort of supernatural entity either friendly or not friendly, who had come to keep an eye on the production. A lot of weird lore is attached to the exorcist, like a lot of weird stuff happened on set supposedly. So maybe some sort of entity in the area wanted to check it out while it was around and make sure it wasn't doing any kind of, I don't know, psychic damage to the area. It's just a theory. I will say though, I haven't heard of other black dog sightings in the area of the Bronx. So maybe there are some and I just don't know of them, but that's a theory at least. So there's one last line from this article that I wanted to read that relates to Hughes Hall. Hughes is also home for a deceased Jesuit novitiate who had perpetually haunted the top floors of the building after his death there several years ago. I think this is the only place I've really seen this story of the novitiate haunting the top floors. I think usually I hear stories about like a little boy living there potentially a former Fordham prep student. I wasn't able to confirm whether a Jesuit died in Hughes Hall in the late 70s or early 80s. I did search novitiate dead Hughes Hall in the Rams archives, and I only found the article that I'm reading from. So while I'm not saying that the story is false, I just haven't really seen much stuff about Jesuits living in Hughes Hall, though it's definitely possible. And I can't find this story repeated elsewhere. Make of it what you will. So let's talk some more about the filming of The Exorcist at Fordham. So The Exorcist was filmed on a couple locations on campus, but for this episode, I just wanna focus on the filming at Hughes Hall and some of the other connections that The Exorcist as a production and as like a piece of art has to Fordham. So a Fordham affiliated Jesuit, Father Birmingham was involved in the production. He was a technical advisor and he had a bit part in the movie. And we have to pause here at Father Birmingham real quick because he is a really, really important part of The Exorcist. And I think that if he, if it wasn't for his influence, just like The Exorcist as a property would not exist. Here's why I say that. Father Birmingham taught at Brooklyn Prep and then Georgetown University. Coincidentally, he taught the author of The Exorcist, you know, because The Exorcist was a book first, he taught the author, William Peter Blatty, at both places. Like he was, he transferred institutions around the same time that Blatty graduated and went to college at Georgetown. In fact, 
While Birmingham was teaching Blatty at Georgetown, he suggested that Blatty do a oration project on demonic possession. And he pointed him toward an article about Roland Doe, which was the real life possession case that inspired the exorcist. So the fact that Blatty was close with a Jesuit suggests to me that maybe he understood a little bit about how the Catholic Church handled exorcisms, because in case you don't know, exorcism is still a thing in the Catholic Church. They try not to talk about it that much. The way it was explained to me back when I was a teenager by someone at my church was that they didn't want to give like the devil too much credit. There's always way more reports of, of possessions than there actually are. So they try to keep it really quiet, but it definitely is still a service that the church provides when it is truly needed. So Blatty probably knew some stuff from Birmingham about how the Catholic Church handled exorcisms. And I wonder, I've been wondering since I was a student and I'm still wondering today, exactly what Fordham University's connection with the rite of exorcism is. What do I mean by that? So I would say I'm putting on my tinfoil hat. It's not really a tinfoil hat thing, though you should take this with a grain of salt because I heard about this secondhand and you're hearing it third hand and it could be totally untrue. So again, with that disclaimer, when I was in school at Fordham, I knew a couple guys who were considering becoming priests and were pretty close with the Jesuits. And, you know, a lot of the time the Jesuits would talk about, talk to them about like what it was like to be a Jesuit at Fordham, et cetera, et cetera. And one of these guys told me that a Jesuit told him that from time to time, priests who were recovering from doing an exorcism would be housed in Fordham's Jesuit infirmary residences. Because Fordham had a number of Jesuit residences on campus and right off campus, and they were used by you know the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, and some of them were kind of like nursing home type infirmaries. Now, you may know that exorcisms are very draining emotionally, energetically, etc. And it is understood that priests are often in really bad shape afterwards, and they need somewhere to recover in safety. And apparently, according to what I was told, Fordham is one of those places because they have these Jesuit residences with you know, medical care attached. It's a place where a priest can go and recover from an exorcism. And I mean, I will say while I was there, it was definitely common to see different Jesuits appearing on campus. I have so many clear memories of walking around campus and seeing Jesuits I didn't recognize, you know, sitting on benches around campus, relaxing. It would be a nice place to recover. It's this beautiful green campus. There's, you know, all these students around. It's full of like life and stuff. Again, make of this story what you will. I happen to believe that it's true. I can't prove it. But if it is true, it might suggest a reason for kind of like why, not an entire reason for why Fordham might be so haunted, but it wouldn't surprise me if that kind of like added something to the atmosphere there. And, you know, again, if Fordham is a place of recovery, fine. Like that means it's a safe haven on the one hand, but then on the other hand, it's like it has potentially this connection to the supernatural, to evil possessions, etc., that I just don't think you can overlook when thinking about the paranormal on Fordham's campus. And in particular, I do know that the number of exorcisms rose after The Exorcist was published and then made into a mega runaway blockbuster type movie, you know? And following that logic, it wouldn't surprise me if like the more exorcists who may or may not have come through campus, the more, and also the more just like exorcism and demons and hauntings, etc., cetera, are on people's minds, the more that might heighten the already existing atmosphere of the paranormal and the mysterious on campus. And so, like I said, my contention or my theory is that Birmingham filled Blatty in on some of the details of exorcism and what it's like to be an exorcist priest. And 
some of those details shaped parts of The Exorcist and kind of like made its DNA to some extent a little bit inextricable from Fordham. And even if you read the book The Exorcist, there's a scene where the, you know, the main character, the priest, goes up to Fordham for like a conference and it mentions specific Jesuit residences on campus, etc. And it's like, if you read that passage, it's pretty gloomy and grim, etc. And it, it, you know, it's good atmosphere for a creepy story. But also there are so many things about Fordham that are gloomy and atmospheric and do make it a good setting for both a horror story and real life paranormal events. So underscoring this idea that potentially Blatty had some inside knowledge about exorcisms, Father Birmingham joined the classics department at Fordham University as a professor in 1969. So remember, Blatty wrote The Exorcist, and it was published in 71. So a couple years, you know, this was probably while Blatty was writing The Exorcist, his mentor, Father Birmingham, moved to Fordham to teach philosophy there. And Birmingham lived on campus and he taught there until his death. He died in 1998 in the Jesuit residence where he lived, which I believe was Loyola Hall, which I think is now a dorm. In the acknowledgments of the exorcist, Blatty wrote, I would like to thank Thomas V. Birmingham, Society of Jesus, Vice Provincial for the Formation of the New York Province of the Society of Jesus, for suggesting the subject matter of this novel. So like, literally, he admits in the book, in writing, Blatty's like, yeah, he suggested this. It was his idea. So, you know, Blatty was the film's producer, so he approached Birmingham to work on the film as well. It's also worth noting that there was another Fordham Jesuit who was involved in the production of The Exorcist. This was a Father William O'Malley, who played Father Dyer in The Exorcist. He was an adjunct professor at Fordham University until 2003, and he taught at Fordham Prep till 2012. He continued living on campus after retiring from teaching until 2019, when allegations of sexual abuse against him came to light. I won't go into details about that here. There's a lot of information online if you want to read the whole story about it. It's very upsetting and bad. So those are some of the connections between The Exorcist and the production of The Exorcist and Fordham. There was a November 4th, 1993 article that I found in the RAM that lists a few other suspicious events associated with the filming of The Exorcist at Fordham that I hadn't seen written elsewhere. So I wanted to read from that. The director, Friedkin, wanted actress Linda Blair to say the Our Father in Latin. To help her memorize it, Birmingham asked a female Fordham student to record her voice. However, before she could do this, she slipped on the ice and broke her jaw. Another freaky event involved Birmingham. During a routine medical checkup, a lump was discovered under his arm. He claims that the tumor was not present before that appointment, even that very morning. Luckily, the tumor was benign, but the doctors kept it for further observation because its consistency was so strange. They had never seen anything like it before. In addition to these problems, there were two deaths around the set. Also, the son of Jason Miller, the leading actor, was seriously injured. This accident happened while Miller was about to reshoot the scene that was filmed in Hughes Hall. So if you look it up again, a lot of there's a lot of really weird, potentially paranormal stuff that happened around the filming of The Exorcist and on the set of The Exorcist. Things were so unpleasant on set that at one point, Friedkin asked Birmingham to exercise the set. Birmingham declined, saying that there wasn't enough evidence of demonic activity, and he didn't want to cause even more anxiety on set. However, some people claim that the set burned to the ground the next day, though other people say it just caught fire. But at any rate, afterwards, Birmingham blessed the set with the entire cast and crew present just to, you know, try to put everyone's minds at ease. So I know I started out this episode saying I also wanted to talk about the University Cemetery, but I've been recording for a really long time now, and it's being made more and more difficult by the fact that my radiators keep freaking out. So I think I mentioned this in the first episode of this Fordham series, but 
old radiators in New York City get really, really loud. So I keep having to switch rooms to record. And right now I'm in the room where the radiator is the quietest, but also I have a ton of road noise. So I think that's just a sign that I've been recording enough for this episode. I think this episode's going to be like almost an hour long. I try not to go too far over an hour. So I'm going to talk about the cemetery in the next episode. And in the look at the cemetery, there is a little bit more about the production of The Exorcist. And there was a paranormal event that supposedly happened after or during the filming of The Exorcist at the cemetery. So excited to get into that. Also, next episode, I'm going to be looking at a lot of stories of ghost priests at Fordham. You know, the last episode had a lot of ghost priests. This episode was a little bit more focused on urban legends from the 80s, etc. But next time we're back to looking at ghost priests. And I just I just love these stories of ghost priests. And then I think probably the episode after next is when I'm going to talk about my most hated building on campus, which I lived in my sophomore year, which was the old medical school, which was truly terrifying. So I'm really excited to get to that episode too in a couple weeks. So a lot of good creepy content coming up. I know this is a long series, but there's just like a lot of weird Fordham stuff to talk about and a lot of angles to look at a lot of these stories through. So until next time, you can check out the show notes at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can follow me on Instagram at buriedsecretspodcast. You can write to me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. In particular, if you went to Fordham and had anything creepy happen, please let me know. I would love to hear other people's stories. And if you liked this episode, please rate and review it. Please tell your friends about it. That's how other people find out about the podcast. Thanks so much for listening.